Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, please be advised that the session is going to be recorded. So I hope you feel comfortable. And that then after this, the, the session today, the recording will be made available uh, to whoever could not join us today. It will be posted on YouTube. Um, it's uh, also, uh, for those who don't know, I don't have a total control about what's recorded. Teams is a little bit tricky with that. So um, if you have your video turned on, uh, please be mindful of that. Sometimes I don't, I don't see you here, but then in the end, uh, when I watch the video recording, I see uh, people, video, the videos from people who I was not seeing, uh, that I was not seeing during the session. So thank you again. Um, I can see in the chat we have Arkansas, Arkansas maybe, that's better pr pronunciation. Please forgive me for that. And we have Atlanta, Abid from Atlanta. And we have uh, Christian Angel from Europe and uh, from Canada, New Zealand. Thank you, everyone. It's time to start, so let's go and do this. Um, as, as usual, there's a couple of uh, announcements that I will have for you. Uh, first thing is some instructions about how the meetup will happen. Uh, as you know, we are using Teams. If you want to participate with questions or comments, you have these little uh, icon speech balloon that you can use to post your questions or comments in, in the chat area. You can also click the button with a little hand to say that you want to ask something. And I'll, I'll excuse me, I'll see here that you that someone has uh, their, their hands uh, uh, risen. And um, microphones and videos it's best if you if we turn them off during the presentation to help with internet and with and uh, quality of the session if any of us for any reason is kicked out of the session for internet issues it has happened even to me uh, the session can continue and the recording will continue even if I drop. So if, an, if any of us has to drop the connection, just reconnect and everything should be okay. Uh, next event and the last one for this year for the meetup, uh, uh, MS Excel Toronto meetup group will be on December the 2nd with Brent Allen and he will be talking about cube functions. It's not a very common topic, uh, can be very useful uh, sometimes. Um, not a lot of people work with them. So if you are curious, feel free to jump in and learn about this. It's, uh, it's a tool that we cannot use in all the circumstances, but in some circumstances when we have to, it's good to know about them. Something about two events coming up. Uh, one is the MVP Conf. Uh, it will be in Brazil, or uh, it's being organized in Brazil, but of course uh, everyone can attend from any part of the world because it will happen online. Uh, most of the sessions will be in Portuguese, but uh, we also have, uh, they, there's also some sessions happening in some presentations in Portuguese and uh, not Portuguese, English and Spanish. Let me just open here my um, intern, my website to show you a little bit of what's going on there on the page. Uh, there's an amazing uh, set of speakers there and we have a few represent representatives of uh, from Microsoft, including Tania, Tania Consentino. She's the president of Microsoft Brazil. She will be speaking at the event. So, uh, and then after that, it's uh, a huge amount of sessions covering uh, all technology, Microsoft technology, not only just Microsoft Office uh, 365, but also artificial intelligence uh, development. Um, you name it, um, in, Internet of Things, and it's it's a never ending. So this is the, the different um, 
it's too small for you. Let me just. Okay, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, this is the list of different. Where is it? This is uh, these are the names of seven um, organizations that will benefit from this uh, event. All the event, all the procedures go to these seven uh, organizations. In fact, when we be, when we buy our ticket, we are when we purchase the ticket at the end, we are notified to which one of the organizations the the money went to. It's a very interesting system, and these are all the different sets of um, different teams, the subjects, uh, subjects that we have for uh, talks. Mobile and of, of uh, Excel, of course, will be here, Office and Productivity. Uh, we have Power BI, anything, you name it. So if you speak uh, Portuguese or Spanish, it's uh, uh, an event that it's worth to, to attend. We, for those here who may speak Portuguese, I will be live tonight uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time or 9 p.m. Uh, Brazilian time, um, together with João Benito Savastano and Gerson, uh, Gerson. Uh, we are good. We are. We will be speaking about the event, giving some information. There will be a draw of free tickets as well. So if you want to participate, uh, feel free to do so. Another event uh, happening in February, where I'll also be speaking, uh, presenting. This one in London was to was programmed for last April, didn't happen, and now it will happen in February online as well. A lot of um, people, a lot of speakers there, four days of content. Feel free to check this out. There's a discount code Celia-10% that you can apply for a discount of 10%. And today we have Ken Pulse with us. Um, I will introduce him right away. If you are willing to post about the session, if you think the session is valuable and you want to share uh, the meetup group, the content, uh, feel free to do so on social media. If you want to use MS Excel Toronto hashtag, it would be great. And you can also find us, both Ken and myself, on online at, in various uh, social media platforms. So that's it for today. I think, I hope I have not forgotten anything. If I did, please let me know. And today we have Ken Pulse with us. Ken has been uh, uh, an MVP for a couple of years. How many years, Ken? Uh, 14, I think. Wow, 14 Something years. Like that. Uh, losing count. <laughs> And uh, and and um, his background is in accounting, right? That's true. So his work started there. He has been developing uh, training. A lot. A lot of his training is focused uh, uh, for on 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 accounting professionals for accounting professionals, but not only that. Can you, can will explain that better? He is one of the authors of the book M is for Data Monkey. Uh, together with Miguel Escobar, and um, I had the pleasure to to meet Ken two years ago in the uh, what's that the name Ignite Microsoft Ignite 2018. It seemed yeah. like an eternity ago. Sure does, doesn't it? <laughs> Back when we actually got to hang out in person with people. Exactly, and I have to say, Ken, I was very impressed uh, with the patience when i was observing you there at the experts so that there there was a stand there at the microsoft ignite called ex, ex um, experts corner or something like that where you were um spending some time helping people who had questions and it really uh, impressed me that they seeing all the patients that you have with everyone coming with all kinds of questions and you would make sure that you would give value to everyone. 
um, that really um, caught my attention. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for all the work that you've been doing as an MVP. Uh, there's a lot of content out there uh, and a lot of uh, and there's things that people don't see because um, being an MVP involves a, a series of, of tasks. Some of them are not seen, are not public. Uh, it's about connecting with the Microsoft uh, Excel team or whatever uh, tool we are we are. Uh, more engaged with providing them with um, with feedback with so it's and, and I know that you do a lot of that and so there's there's your contribution there too. Um, so today when you are going to talk about one of the tools that you developed to help with working with Excel and Power Query I believe. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about Monkey Tools, which is a software that uh, that we've been building and trying to help uh, help make it easier for people to build good data models. So it should be uh, should be hopefully fun and interesting to people. I'm very excited about that. I want to learn about it. I started the other day, but I haven't had the time to explore it uh, thoroughly. So I'm hoping that I, I'll be better informed after this session today. So I don't want to take more of your time and the time of our um, uh, members today attending today I'll pass the mic to you please let us know what we what you have for us today Ken. all right no problem so let me just share my screen here and then um, while I do this I'm just going to pull up teams and I think just to uh, just to do this uh, as as well as I can I'm actually going to turn off my video and make sure that we actually uh, preserve the bandwidth uh, for the screen because you'd prefer to see that than my face anyway um, so uh, first off I want to say uh, just a big shout out and a thanks to uh, to all my friends who've shown up for this this is fantastic um, I was wondering how long it was going to take from someone from the UK to actually admit they were here but uh, you know Alan Roger I see you guys so uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming along um, hopefully we'll give you guys everyone here a good show as to, to what's okay. going on so there's sorry to interrupt you there's also yeah. Alan uh, Murray and uh, Oakley uh, different people from the UK I can and it's a, late and it's ton. late for them it's like yeah them, no yeah. for sure for sure and uh, I mean you know as I say I, I think it's awesome actually to see people we've got from uh, from New Zealand to uh, to um, Australia and then all the way out to Romania and all points in between so uh, thanks a lot I uh, appreciate y'all showing up for this and um, as I say let's uh, let's move this in and we'll we'll get this started and let's talk a little bit about what we've got going on here so uh, for those of you who don't know me I'll give you a really really brief introduction as to who I am um, and why you should pay attention to uh, what I have to show Show you here. Um, so my name is uh, is Ken. Um, I'm also a, as Celia mentioned, I am an accountant. I'm an FCPA, FCMA, uh, and I've held my accounting designation since uh, 2000, so 20 years now, which means that my real in life picture has less hair than what you actually see on screen here. Um, but I've been around the accounting game for a long time. Although, uh, to be completely honest with you, about uh, I guess it was about five years ago now, I actually quit my full-time accounting job and decided to uh, focus full-time on spending my time working on my own company, which is Excel Guru. Um, so I have a website, a blog, and a forum. Uh, I also am a founding partner at a company called Skillwave.Training. And what we do is we do training on working with Power Query, working with Power Pivot, working with Excel and Power BI. Um, our whole sort of focus is around teaching people how to build better data models to get intelligence out of their data. So I'm actually less focused on accounting today as much as I am getting data or information out of data because, you know, what data is the same in a lot of different cases, whether it's sales or whether it's finance or, or whatnot is, you know, data is data needs to be summarized in order to extract insights. Uh, as Celia mentioned, I am an MVP. I have been, I got my first award way back in 2006. I've been awarded in a variety of different categories, including Excel, uh, Data Platform, which looks after Power BI. Um, and now we're currently in a, a category called Office Apps and Services, which basically means the Office Suite. Um, I still count myself very much as an Excel guy at heart. So uh, I'm also, amongst other things, a software developer and author. Um, I wrote the book uh, Emma's for Data Monkey with my co-author Miguel Escobar. Um, you'll see some nod to some of that stuff in here today. And what we're going to be talking about today is a software that I've been working on for quite some time uh, called Monkey Tools. And I was actually looking through some stuff with my developer the other day 
and we found some of the code samples that I actually wrote um, and and had a uh, almost full fledged version of this uh, back in 2012. So it's taken me an awful long time to actually get this out to market, but I'm pretty happy that we're you know moving forward on it now and um, and putting some stuff out that's value. Now my biggest issue is just telling people about it and you know letting them know what we actually do. So uh, so that's what we're here about today. So before we jump into that. I want to just give you a little bit of an idea as to my modeling philosophy. Um, I'm actually right now in the uh, in the first show of a virtual tour across Canada that's happening this week. So I'm I'm presenting with uh, Celia today. I'm going to be talking to the Calgary uh, user group tomorrow, and then Vancouver on Thursday. Uh, so we're moving from from east coast to west across Canada um, for different presentations, all focused on different things. But all of it sort of comes back to the philosophy that I actually deal with working with data and. My philosophy in many ways is this. As I say, I'm an Excel guy at heart. So if I'm going to build a model for any reason to go and summarize data, I generally open my go-to tool, which is Excel. Once I've done building my data model, at that point, if I want to actually go and start to share it and enrich it with some you know, cooler visuals that I maybe don't have in Excel, I can publish it to Power BI, build some more reports online, and then share it with my users. I'm very much a believer in the better together story where we can use all of the great tools that we have in Excel to work nice and rapidly and really test things in an ad hoc and, and very structured way and then get some of the benefits of Power BI as far as some of the really cool reports that we can build and the security from the sharing side of things. On occasion, I have also built stuff in Excel, had to import it into Power BI Desktop, build some reports there and then publish those to Power BI. Uh, but honestly, if I can actually skip the import to Power BI Desktop, I will. I usually try to do most of the stuff that I have in Excel. And in a lot of cases, you actually can skip the whole thing and just go direct to Power BI from there. So this is kind of the philosophy that I like to approach my, uh, my tasks. And my presentation tomorrow is going to talk a little bit about why some of the benefits are, of doing these kind of things are and using the best tool for the best job. So the question is, how does Monkey Tools actually go and fit into this? So the target audience for this particular software, and I like to be really, really upfront with um, with uh, with people about this here, because I don't ever want to try and sell someone a piece of software they don't actually need. My target audience is very much people who work like I do. It's people that work in Excel, they build models, and they do a lot of work with Power Query and Power Pivot, and then potentially try and go and distribute them. Uh, the other side of the target audience that I work with is people who inherit models from other people and are trying to figure out what the heck that person was actually doing. What's in this model? What am I actually looking at? So this is kind of a two-pronged tool. It's one of the things is about building stuff better. The other one is about actually looking at something and trying to figure out what the heck you've received, or even trying to remind yourself what you did to your model uh, in the last, you know, last iteration that you did. So I'm going to show you a variety of the different features that we have uh, going through this. Um, the session is going to be mostly demos. Uh, but uh, I should probably also talk a little bit about this side as well. Um, for the pricing model, we actually have, um, I guess you could say it's three, but it's really two different prices. There is a forever free version of this tool. Uh, I am an MVP. I get that by helping the community. And this is a big part of my philosophy in life is helping people do things. So there is always um, and forever will be a free version of Monkey Tools that is available. Uh, it will have a bunch of useful functionality in it that will help you out. Um, but you can get some bigger and better stuff if you're willing to go and actually send me a little bit of money as well to help support my development. Uh, we do have a trial pro license. It uh, gives you two weeks for uh, of all of the pro features except for one, and then reverts to free after that. And if you're interested in, uh, in the thing because you recognize that, hey, there's some huge value here, uh, there's a pro license subscription that you can actually subscribe to as well. You can find full details uh, here at xlguru.ca slash monkey tools. gives you a very, very full page. Um, and if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can actually pick up a free trial of the software. And I'll give you the, a link to that at the end of this as well. Let's talk a little bit about the ribbon uh, because Monkey Tools is an Excel add-in. Uh, it gets installed and it has its own full ribbon on the Excel tab. Uh, we basically divide this up into what I would sort of classify as convenience features. What those are is they're features that already exist in Excel, but I put them all on one ribbon. And then there's a section of Monkey Tools features. So I just want to throw this out there real quick and just a, a sort of a nod to someone who I don't think is here today, but one of my friends actually uh, posted a suggestion on Excel user voice for adding a reporting ribbon to Excel to consolidate and highlighting all these amazing capabilities of Power Query and Power Pivot. 
interestingly enough, Microsoft came back and declined it. And unfortunately, they closed the comment so fast, I wasn't able to come in and say, then maybe pick up Monkey Tools, because essentially that's what Monkey Tools in a lot of ways actually does, is it provides a full-on ribbon to this. So, um, you know, if you didn't, or if you saw this and went, oh, that's really too bad, there is a, a hope for it, and this is what this software is about. So the way that I sort of look at it is I have these convenience features. These are things that you can find inside Excel data button from table blank query, uh, launch power query, editor, show queries and connections. Those are all on the data tab. Um, and actually, so is the manage data model and refresh all. But what we do is we actually go and add a whole bunch more capability as well in some things that we have called monkeys and sleuths. The idea behind this is that monkeys help you build stuff and the sleuth, it's a word for detective in the English language, will actually go back and help you try and figure out what's going on. Uh, so this is the sort of general philosophy of what we actually here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in and hop over to Excel, and I'm going to give you guys a demo of how we can actually go through and use some of these things together. So here we go. I'm going to pop over to Excel and take a look at, uh, at what we got. So um, all right, and uh, I'm just uh, sort of uh, looking at the, uh, the chat going on here um, on the side, and I'm going to try and sort of monitor that as it goes. Although, um, Celia, if I miss anything, feel free to interrupt me as well. Sure. Um, and yeah, uh, Oakley, you can absolutely uh, file publish directly um, from, uh, from Excel, because uh, that's one comment I see here. didn't realize you can go directly here. Uh, you can go file publish, and at this point in time, if you have a workbook, you can either upload the workbook, so this will actually let you see your Excel worksheets right in Excel online, uh, and you can play around with them, update them, save them, all that kind of jazz. The other side is export. Basically what this does is it exports your Power Query and your data model directly into Power BI, at which point when you hop over there, depending on where your data sources are from, you can schedule a refresh on them. You can also go through and start building reports using the Power BI online builders, so you actually don't really need Power BI Desktop in some instances. Um, I would say a lot of instances, to be honest with you. But um, having said that, I also do not want to be seen here as um, trying to denigrate the use of Power BI Desktop. I'm just saying that there's some tools here that overlap. So, you know, you don't have to be forced in that direction. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about monkey tools. So basically what I'm going to do in this case here is I'm going to give you a real quick sort of a demo through um, some of the functionality of monkey tools. And you say my philosophy behind this, what I've sort of written up with this, is the idea behind monkey tools is to help you build better models faster. So when I go and take a look at this particular uh, set of tables here, I have three tables of data. And right now, they're just stored inside an Excel worksheet. Here we go. So we got a sales table, categories, and a budgets table. And I've actually already pulled these into the data model. I've built some nice queries here. These little raw data connections essentially connect to the Excel tables. That's it. Okay, there's their one step. And then these guys here uh, reference the other ones, and then they set the data types and load it to the data model. Okay, these are not complicated. Very, very simple pieces here. I'm just going to jump into the data model. You'll notice that I'm on my Monkey Tools tab. Um, this the model. I'm going to show you the model that I've built so far. It looks like this, highly complicated. And what we've got here is we're just linking category to category and category to category. So this is the basis of where I've started. But I'm missing a couple of different pieces in order to actually make my model work. One of the key things that I'm missing, a calendar table to be able to link my sales and budgets together. I'm also missing some measures. And I'd like to create myself a separate table specifically to hold those measures as well. So these are just some of the things that I would like to do with things. So I can do all that. It would probably take me about 10 or 12 minutes to go and do all of that stuff modeling, uh, you know, the sort of the manual way. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to do something, and I've actually timed myself through this. If I'm not trying to demo it, I can do this in about three minutes with my tools. So it, it really cuts the time down. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start by creating a calendar using Calendar Monkey. This one here is a pro feature. Um, anything above the line here is not, but anything below the line is. But uh, so I'm going to jump into Calendar Monkey. And basically, what we've done is we built a little user interface here. And uh, the idea is that it asks you, tell me what kind of calendar you'd like. Now, I can create a 12 month calendar, a 445, 454, a 13 fiscal period calendar. 
I'm going to stick with a standard 12 month, but I am going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to go with not a December 31st year end because my company has a September 30th year end. So I'm going to go with September 30th. I'm going to call it calendar. I'm going to load it to the data model. There we go. And I want to work out, I want to build this dynamic calendar directly based on the data that's in my model. So I always want it to span the entire fiscal year from whenever my earliest date is to the latest date that I have in my data. The earliest date, I'm going to go and pick out of my sales table. And my latest possible date, I'm going to pick out of my budgets table because I always budget before sales happen. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say next. And you'll notice it comes up with a whole bunch of checkboxes. And it says, fantastic, what columns do you want on your calendar table? I go, okay, well, you know what? These look like pretty good choices. Uh, one thing that I will point out with this one here is that if you check a box on this, it saves it for next time. So it'll learn what your preferred calendar sort of structure is for these things, and it saves those into, uh, into its defaults. I'm now going to click next and it says, cool. So you picked that you wanted this to go from the budget date and sales date. I'm just going to create those relationships for you in the data model. Fantastic. And we'll say create. And at this point, what's going to happen is it will go through and it will actually start creating the individual queries that it needs. This is following the exact um, calendar recipe uh, format that I actually use. Uh, it's one of the Power Query recipe cards that we actually have um, available at SkillWave. And when I teach people how to do dimensional modeling courses, that we always teach them, create yourself a start date query, create yourself a, um, an end date query, and at that point, create yourself a dynamic calendar. This takes a little bit of, uh, of time to load, but it's got 1,096 rows. And uh, at this point, it now gives you a little bit of information here to say, this is what you need to do. You need to open Power Pivot, go to Diagram View, select your relationships. It's a lot of words here. Um, I'm going to show you how this works, but one thing that I do want to point out with here is that unlike the way that Power Query generally works, I don't lock you away from your user interface. This dialog can stay open, so you can move this onto another screen. I can go and click on this, hop over to the data model. I can come in to the diagram view here, and I can say, right. What it actually says is, let's go and right-click and hide this from client tools, right-click and hide this from client tools. There we go. That's basically the gist of what it is. But while I'm in here, I'm also going to do something else. I'm just going to hop over to the data model here. I'm going to go to calendar. I'm going to find my month short over here, which is my short form of my month. And I'm going to choose to sort it by a column. And I'm going to choose to sort this by the month of fiscal year. Now, I wish I could automate this for you, but unfortunately, Microsoft doesn't give me a way to do that. There's nothing in the object model that allows me to connect to this. And I've hacked through a whole bunch of stuff, but that one is just something that I have not been able to, uh, unfortunately, break through. All right. Now, the next thing that I want to do, I want to add myself a measures table. Now, there's a trick for doing this, uh, but my trick is this. I'm just going to go add measures table, and it's going to pop up and say, what do you want to call it? I'm going to call it underscore measures because you can't use just plain old measures. That's a reserved word. So we go in and we say, OK. And at this point, now what you see is we get a new one here. And it says, hey, we just need you to do something for us in order to turn it into official measure table, open power pivot, locate it. I need you to hide the measures column. This is another thing, unfortunately, that I do not have the ability to automate is the hiding of this column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop over into diagram view. And I'm just going to go and hide this right here. Bingo. There we go. And you know what? While I'm here, I'm actually going to go and hide a couple more columns because Category is a foreign key, an amount is an unaggregated column, but I need to create some measures for this thing. Um, just a, a quick um, note, um, I just want to say, uh, Oakley, thank you for that comment. Monkey Tools working just for the calendar, fantastic, love it. Um, I'm happy that you feel that way. So this is one of the reasons why, I'm actually really proud of that. It's a pretty cool feature. Uh, okay, so my data model set up now with a measures table ready to hold measures, but I don't have any. So I want to show you guys a new feature, um, two on this menu. Only one of these is public so far. So for some of you, well, for anybody that's watching this, this is going to be some brand new stuff here. So if I go to create basic explicit measure, I'm not actually going to do this. But uh, what's going to happen here is I can go to amount. And I'm trying to take the power query philosophy of no code to this particular environment. Basically, what can happen here is you can say, look, I want a distinct count of this column 
we are creating the DAX for you here. All you need to do is just give me a name and choose your number format down the bottom. And again, we're trying to be really smart about what we actually provide here for you um, as your default. So I'm not going to do this this time here, though, because this only creates one measure at a time. And I actually want to show you a different feature. So this guy is not out public yet. We're just doing some final testing on it. But this guy is. If I go to multiple explicit measures, we go into our measure builder. So the idea here is that I'm going to create multiple measures all at one time. I need to create them based on budgets and sales. Now, I just want to show you that I actually know about all the tables in the data model here. So I could come back and show you all of these guys. But the reality is I'm making a pretty, what I believe is a good guess about this to say, you have some relationships all the way down. I know that some of your tables are fact tables because they only have many relationships on them. So the chances are pretty good that those are the fields that you want to aggregate. So we actually make a smart choice here and say, we're going to just show you these guys here, budget sales, because that's probably where your stuff is. I also know that you created yourself a, um, a measures table that is specific. So I'm going to just go and offer to, to drop this stuff on here. If you didn't create one, you can create a measures table right from here. If you don't have a measures table and you don't want to use it, we actually default to using your host table instead, which means we would store the measure on sales or budgets. Uh, Henry, your question, so Monkey Tools is bringing DAX to Excel. Um, DAX already exists in Excel. It, it's been there forever. Uh, what I'm bringing is I'm bringing something similar to a, um, I'm bringing some similar to quick measures, I guess, from Power BI, if you like. Um, I actually originally wrote a spec on this about, oh man, uh, 2013. Um, I'm just finally getting around to actually doing some of this. But where we're starting is we're starting with the easy measures. And you're going to see that right now when I go and click next. Uh, what we do is we come up and say, okay, well, you're building a bunch of facts here. So let's go and build this for you nice and quick. So you can do them one at a time. Or in this case, I say, you know what? I'm going to go and say I'd like a measure called budget dollars going to default to a currency format. And over here, I'm going to go and create myself a sales dollar measure and again, create that with a currency format. But I want one more measure too. So I'm going to go add another aggregation. This one is going to be based not on one of the columns from the table, but it's going to be based on the actual sales table itself. I'm going to count the rows and I'm going to call this lovely little one transactions because who wouldn't want a transactions count inside things? And again, we, uh, we start and go... Um, about uh, um, we start to with a whole number here because I think that's you know the best format if we're doing an actual count uh, side of things here. So at this point, I'm going to go and say create. Um, so uh, I, I actually uh, I actually love the um, the comment that just came in here from Alan saying it's interesting. Uh, Marco Russo, um, who many people know as as uh, one of those uh, DAX gods out there, is very much against having a separate measure table and argues why not. Um, you know, you like the you like the idea, cool. Um, I personally only ever use measure tables in demo. I can't stand them. I would much rather put them on my fact tables, but I get asked for this all the time, so I show it anyhow. So we give you the option to do it. Because at the end of the day, it's your model. And I can't tell you how you should be modeling. I can give you my advice. But you know what? If you want to do this this way, you know, good on you. I personally like to put my measures on their individual host tables because I think it makes them easier to find them and scope them. So it kind of acts like a little bit of a folder to hold them. But hey, you know, it's up to you. So the big thing is I'm giving you the option to do what you want. All right. We've created some measures, but we don't see any yet. So let's go and see what we got. So I'm going to create a new worksheet. Going to come down here into, uh, I don't know, we'll go and drop it in this cell here. Um, this also is not on the Monkey Tools ribbon, uh, but when I was working on stuff today, I was like, why don't I have this here? So I just added this into our, uh, what will hopefully come out soon. But I'm going to create a new pivot table right from a um, from the uh, Monkey Tools uh, ribbon here against the data model. We'll say OK. And just like that, we now pick up all of our stuff. A uh, big rule of thumb, of course, if you're working with Excel, is you want to make sure that you only ever use the tables that have the golden buckets on them because these guys live in the worksheet, which is honestly not really an ideal thing to do here. Um, these guys here should not be used. They're the ones without the little golden bucket on them. But you'll notice here that uh, what I have is I've got myself a nice little setup of stuff, and I'm going to go to my calendar. I'm going to go and put my month short on rows. I'm going to go to my measures table, and I think I'm going to put on transactions and sales and budgets. Uh, notice that we are also picking up the default formats right off the bat. 
you can see that I already set up my stuff to sort in my um, in my order that I want for my uh, fiscal month ends because October for me is the first month of the fiscal year. And at this point, I can now go and start building myself a nice little piece here. I can put class on uh, on the columns. There we go, separated nicely, or I can move things around. I mean, at this point, honestly, all of this is just working with a data model, right? We've got things set up correctly. But the big thing that I want to sort of just sort of flow through here is what we're trying to do with monkey tools. We're trying to make it easy to work from left to right on the job that we're dealing with, right? We start with getting data. So we brought in the power query buttons that are here. And again, these are the standard power query buttons. We've built some extra features in here to try and make things a little bit easier. Uh, for some of you in Europe, um, this came out recently. We actually can inject an ISO week function directly into the data model. So if you're uh, interested in getting the ISO week, we actually pick it up in two different formats. One is just a week number. The other one is a uh, sort of a fully qualified ISO week based on uh, what I read on, on Wikipedia that is preferred. Um, and then we sort of work our way across. We'll get into the sleuths in a little bit here. And then we work into the actual data modeling with the pivot tables. Uh, and we'll get a little bit more into what these things are and then reporting a little bit later on. So the journey here that took me to go from adding my calendar table all the way through to actually creating my pivot with my measures here. Uh, when I tested this, just walking through it, took me three minutes. And, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to actually try and do that, to be able to go and build yourself a calendar table on the fly by coding it in Power Query and then go and create your measures and set your default formats up, doing that manually uh, index. Even though these are really easy ones, um, the, the big key on this whole thing is we're just trying to make this UI driven and, and make life an awful lot easier here and get you back to the, the idea that the Power Platform is working where we're, you know, no code, low code experiences along the way. And I have a, an awful lot of ideas about what I want to put into this area and a whole bunch of drafts. Let's say I originally had a version of this in, uh, in 2013 that never saw the light of day. And we're actually starting to go through this and rebuild this now because we have much more capability than we did back in 2012 uh, when I originally started coding. this. So, so there's your first sort of demo of, uh, of how, um, how monkey tools uh, actually goes and works. Um, you know, as we go through this, please uh, fire questions into this thing, uh, left, right, and center. I love questions, love to talk about this, and, and I'm happy to uh, to sort of, you know, get distracted on, on what's going on. I mean, I'd like to make sure that you guys get uh, get what you like out of this stuff here. So um, the next thing that I want to sort of uh, lead in and, and chat about on this one here is uh, some of the other convenience features that uh, that we have um, in the in some of these menus here. Now, if you have read Emma's for Data Monkey and you're familiar with um, with the sort of setup behind things here, uh, one of the things that you'll know is that we have a, a function called FN get parameter. Um, it's a kind of a gross function to have to grab from a text file and copy into things all the time and then set up an Excel table. Uh, so basically what I've done here is I've actually got a uh, parameter table button that automatically goes and injects the parameter table right inside here. And if I go and take a look at the um, queries here, you'll notice that we've actually injected the function directly in here as well. So if you know how to use that, or if you don't, you can always inject it and then pick it up from the user guide here. The documentation actually talks about how to actually use this. Uh, Henry, your question, the earliest version of Excel um, that will work with Monkey Tools, uh, we restrict to Excel 2016. Uh, we don't go back any earlier than that. Um, I, my biggest piece of advice to you is to try and get on Office 365. Having said that, I know that that's a challenge sometimes working with IT, uh, but we will work with Excel 2016, 2019, and 365. Um, everything works in 365. There are some things in 2016 that may tell you that it doesn't go just because we don't have access to certain pieces of the UI. So just or, or back end rather modeling. So. Uh, Mac versions, no, uh, we do not work with, do not support the Mac version of Excel. Uh, the main reason for that is twofold. Uh, number one is that Power Query is very limited in Mac, um, so we can't really do a lot with it. And Power Pivot in Mac is non-existent. So basically there'd be no point for it. I just can't do anything with it. So once they bring Mac to full feature um, parity, at that point, I will start to evaluate whether or not it makes sense for us to actually go and look at that or not. Um, but uh, I honestly don't see the Mac 
I don't know how long it's going to take for them to get that to uh, to parity. I mean, it's only been 10 years so far, and they haven't really taken it anywhere near power pivots. So um, that's the the challenge there. So unfortunately, no, Max, best advice I can give you, uh, run a hypervisor on your Mac, install the Windows version of Excel, and then you've got real Excel to work with. Unfortunately, the Mac version is a little bit um, lacking when it comes to the power stuff. I, I wish it was different. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not going to actually make use of this guy here, but one thing that you will notice is that we actually picked um, picked up that uh, what I've got here is um, I've got a SharePoint file path. This is a killer if you're actually trying to work with certain things. Uh, I won't demo this today because I actually have an issue with connecting to my SharePoint server that, uh, that I've just received, but uh, we actually have a smart folder query here. Um, what happens with this one is it actually injects something that allows you to do a smart switch between a local file path and your SharePoint file path. So when you open it up and it automatically opens from SharePoint, even if you coded it in your local file path version, it will still work, which is pretty nice. We also have a smart folder function. One of the big challenges around trying to connect to a, a SharePoint folder is that if you put in the full file path to the SharePoint folder, it won't work. You have to go to the root and then drill down to it. I built a function here that makes that a heck of a lot easier. You put in the entire file path and it just does it for you. So um, that's kind of a, a cool thing um, here. So uh, so just something to uh, to be aware of in, uh, in that particular case. We won't demo those ones today, um, but it is kind of a, a neat little feature that, uh, that we have in here to make life a little bit easier as well. Now, um, while I'm in here, I want to start sort of just walking across some of the other different features that we have in here as well. Uh, let me pull up this one here. This is called Destination Sleuth. Um, what Destination Sleuth is all about is trying to give you a user interface that gives you a little bit more information than what you actually see down on the right-hand side here. Uh, in this particular case, we can see that we have 3,284 rows loaded for sales, um, but the big question is where? You can't really see this very cleanly and easily without mousing over each and every individual thing. This user interface here is to very quickly go through and say, okay, I'm looking at my connection only versus my data model queries. If something's loaded to a worksheet, it'll be blue. If it's loaded to both a worksheet and the data model, it will be orange. We also allow you to make um, quick changes to multiple queries at the same time through this. If I wanted to go and say, hey, you know what, this end date and this start date, for whatever reason, I want to load these to the data model. What I could do is I could go in and say, cool, let's load them to the data model and update the load destinations. And at this point, you can see that these guys are going to change here and they will end up loading to the data model. Here comes the first one. End date is done with one row loaded. It's a short one. And start date is doing its thing right now. And then we'll, uh, we'll refresh our dealie over here. It's loaded to the data model. If I want to change that and load it to somewhere else, maybe I want to load it to connection only. So I'll go back and grab my start date and my end date, I can now do load destinations and say, okay. Now, you're not gonna do that a ton for, for one query at a time, but if you're trying to actually work with a whole bunch, this can be really helpful. Maybe you had a model that you built and you only got to choose one load destination because you created all of these things all at the one time. Uh, I typically load everything to connection only, and then I can hop into destination flute and change just the queries I want to go to the data model a lot easier than doing one at a time. Uh, we also recently, um, well, actually, when we first put this in, we actually added a feature to name sheets after your queries uh, because Excel didn't do that. It now does automatically, which is kind of nice. Um, but we also have a component here where if you accidentally load a whole bunch of worksheets to, a t or to tables, you can actually switch them to connection only and delete the host worksheets that actually had those tables on right away, get rid of them. You can update sheet names, things like that to match your queries. Um, so just some extra convenience features, again, along the way here. Uh, now, I'm going to show you another uh, little component here before I jump into a different demo. This one here is called Query Sleuth. And what Query Sleuth does is it actually gives you a window where you can go and pop directly into your queries, and you can take a look at the code that has actually been built. So I mentioned to you guys that I built a calendar table. Uh, when I went and injected my, my calendar button, um, it actually injected a full-blown power query behind the calendar table. And now here's the, um, here's the oh, actually, um, cool. So 
Uh, I see a, just a question that uh, that's come into the chat here um, around the version number on the last update. Uh, some people are seeing a number um, on Monkey Tools where it's been formatted as a date serial number. Yeah, we know. Um, we fixed that. That's going to be out in the next bug fix as soon as I get another feature tested. So uh, thanks, Aware. Definitely got that one handled. Um, it is coming soon. So uh, I promise. Um, <clears throat> But you know, but it's awesome to see that you guys are actually looking at this kind of stuff. That's great. Uh, so, um, so here we go. So I'm looking at my calendar. Uh, a couple of things that you're going to notice about this. Number one, this is the code from the advanced editor inside the Power Query editor. Uh, what you're actually looking at is number one, it's indented code, which Power Query doesn't do for you by default. The default look of this would actually look more like, oh, that one's not. Hang on a second, let me unindent it. There we go. It would look more like this. And um, and the, the challenge in this particular case here is that I find this a little bit tough to read, although we do actually add some extra syntax highlighting in this. You'll notice that we've got start date and end date. These are two precedent queries for what's actually going on in here. And uh, so we are, we're actually showing that there's some precedents along the way here. I prefer to look at these things in an indented format. It tells me a little bit more about what's going on. And when you get used to this, it's actually really hard to read your code when it's not in an indented format. Makes the queries pretty long, to be honest with you, but uh, but you can actually really start seeing a lot of uh, a lot of individual components from this when it's actually nicely indented. Um, this is a full editable section here. You can actually make changes. You can click update, and it will write it back to Power Query. And a really cool thing about this, I can actually go still ex um, select something in Excel and then go back to it. I'm not locked out of the Excel UI when I'm playing around with this. Which, if you work with Power Query code at all, you'll know to get into the advanced editor include, involves opening up the Power Query window, going to the advanced editor, forgetting what you actually needed to look at, closing everything down to go back to Excel, then opening it all back up again. So this makes life a heck of a lot easier in that case. This is also a full dependency tracer. So when you go and you just double click on things, it'll actually show you where your queries are coming from. Oh, that wasn't the one I wanted. It'll actually show you where all of your queries are coming from. So calendar, takes end date and start date as queries that are actually running here. And I see I've got a bug that I've got to end up sorting out on this one actually. Uh, but at the end of the day, the really cool thing here is we can actually start tracing through things to figure out exactly what's going on um, along the way and where these things are coming from. My bug right now is that sales is not showing up as a precedent here and it should be. So um, I have a meeting with my developers as soon as I'm off the call here and this is gonna be one of those things that we're gonna go and take a look at. Now. Um, the big cool thing here is you can actually play around with these. We've got a few different uh, different pieces here. So if I want to go and actually check on endpoint only, you can see just the queries that hits the end. So I can see that fn get parameter is not being used by anything. It will be potentially safe to remove this guy here. Uh, we have a legend to tell you what's going on. The default normal set of the things that's actually already there, of course, and a couple of different things. If you don't like color, you can turn that off. That's totally up to you. Um, but at the end of the day, this uh, this works quite nicely for playing around. As I say, it is fully editable. So if I wanted to come back here and say, you know, I wanted to set this to a, um, a type text, for example, and then I wanted to move to another query, this is actually also something. Would I like to discard the changes? No. We actually have a tabbed editor up front here, so you can actually work in multiple queries at the same time. So um, similar to what uh, what Brent has sort of mentioned, it's kind of like DAX Studio, but for M, yeah, we've kind of got that sort of philosophy going behind things. And again, I've got a massive laundry list of things that I want to add to uh, to what you actually have going on in here. Uh, all right, I'm going to close this one down right now. Um, yes, I'm going to exit this. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hop into a different file uh, to show you something else um, around what we're working with here. So before I move across to, uh, to the next um, particular model, um, what I have here is I have a model that has a few different queries in it. Now, I'm going to show you what they look like by going into Query Sleep. So you can see in this particular case, if I just go and show my legend on this, I've got a compound that is loaded to the data model and the worksheet. UI-driven DM is loaded just to the data model. I've got three that are actually loading out to tables and a few connection-only queries here as well. Now, the big thing that I want to actually just show you on this one here is this is my buffered query. Okay, So this is a very special query here. And it has a specific line of code in it called table.buffer that is buffering this lookup table. If I go and take a look at unbuffered, this is exactly the same code, except that we're returning 
the lookup table and it's not buffered. I find this a lot easier to look at than trying to go through the advanced editor because you have to pop into the advanced editor, go out of it, navigate to something else, go into it. It's not nearly as easy as making a one click sort of step back and forth to go, okay, so yeah, it's just the table.buffer line that's a little bit different here. Why is this important? If you play with Power Query a lot, speed becomes an issue that you actually want to go in and take a look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to check the speed on these two guys. And I'm going to run this using a time sleuth feature. Now, this is a relatively rudimentary timer, to be honest with you. We're waiting for some more capabilities like or in Power BI to come along the way here. But I would like to actually go and take these two queries over here, and I'd like to run them and actually test the performance for these. But what I'm going to do is I'm also going to chart the variation on this. I'm going to do five trials here, and I'm going to double this to time the effect of turning privacy on or off. Because one of the things that I know from working with this is when you turn privacy off, it can sometimes run a little bit faster. Having said that, you want to know the, you know, the dangers in doing this. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to run a refresh of the selected uh, queries here. I'm just going to make this a little bit taller so we can see what's going on. But when I hit refresh on this, you'll notice it's going to go through and it's going to start actually doing the, uh, the timing of these individual queries. Now, it's going to run uh, each of these queries, uh, so both of them, five times. While it's doing that, I'll just talk a little bit about what has to happen in this. Your queries, in order to be timed, must load to either a worksheet or the data model. I cannot time connection-only queries because they don't load anywhere. So that's one little challenge along the way here. A detailed refresh all is going to basically do exactly what we're doing here for every single query in the list. I don't want to do that because it's going to take a little bit too long. The standard refresh all will basically do the action of a data refresh all. Your detailed is always going to take longer than your standard, even though it does the same work overall, because our detailed actually ignores any child node caching and it goes back right to the source and it goes through and times everything. So it does them all independently of each other. The reason that I use this thing, the reason I developed it mainly is to try and figure out which one of my queries in a massive data model was taking the longest amount of time to run. Because when I actually ran the refresh on it, it was taking over five minutes, I think, and my attention span is about 15 and 20 seconds maximum. So I would get up and walk away and come back, and then you can't really see things. Also, timing with a stopwatch is highly variable. The other thing that's really important to know about this, and the reason I'm actually running this over five trials, is because Power Query has a single threaded engine. And what that means is when it goes and it actually farms things out to the processor thread and starts running its refreshes, it is highly susceptible to the other things that are going on on your computer, which means that if you decide to start watching a YouTube video while you're waiting for your timing to go, and that YouTube video happens to hit on the same thread as what Power Query is doing, it restricts the amount of resources that Power Query can use to do its run and therefore slows things down. So that's something that you actually want to watch out for as well. By timing multiple refreshes on this, we generally get an idea and we can take some of the variation out of it so we can get kind of an, an idea as to what's actually happening. So through the first five trials, unfortunately, um, these guys here, this is where we actually have our privacy checks active. So these ones are going to take a little bit longer. I probably should have only done this for, for three um, just to speed it up. But this one's going to go through and unfortunately takes uh, about you know, 35 or, or 36 seconds to go through and, and do each one of these. So um, I should mention on this one here, there's different ways to do this in Power BI. Uh, Power BI actually has a, a little bit more tooling that's available where we can actually time directly to get specific steps and whatnot. Unfortunately, my tool doesn't work with Power BI and we don't have that same granularity of control um, in Excel as we do with Power BI. Uh, I've asked for that. I mean, it's been in Power BI for quite some time. Um, it just hasn't been seen as, as big enough priority to switch this thing out. And basically what they're going to be doing is they're going to be changing the entire format of the file that gets generated. So I don't actually you know, want to go through and, and try and work out a ton of stuff around the, the systems that are actually in there because it would be uh, lost work along the way. So hopefully one day. So, um, so Christian tell me he used this yesterday evening to compare and chart uh, um, a specific solution. So Christian, did it work for you? I mean, um, and while you're doing that, uh, how does Power BI and Excel compare performance-wise? Uh, Henry, the big 
that one really depends, honestly, on whether or not you're using 64-bit Excel or whether you're using 32-bit Excel, because chances are pretty good that you're using a 64-bit Power BI. Um, if they're actually in the same uh, version, like the bitness is comparable, uh, overall, the performance differences shouldn't be massive, depending on where you're actually loading the data. Everything in Power BI goes directly into the data model. If you start loading it into worksheets, or even worse, if you load it to both the worksheet and the data model, you can see some significant effects that, uh, that happen there. So, uh, awesome. Okay, this completed. So what's happened is it's actually logged all of the results into a nice little worksheet, so you can see them here. Uh, we've put a nice little box chart um, on this thing as well. Inside my documentation is a link to go and read more about how to interpret a box and whisker chart if you've never worked with one of these things. Uh, but basically what you're looking at is the X is the uh, the midpoint here. Uh, the boxes or the lines at the top and bottom of this show you the highest and lowest values we had from our refresh. And what we have in the, uh, the in the box itself is it's showing you the um, the middle half essentially of, of the results that are actually going on in this case. Uh, the big thing that you'll notice here is that buffered is always faster than unbuffered, or at least on average is always faster. Um, my unbuffered queries take a little bit longer. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually jump over and show you some of the previous results. So this is where I've actually run it before, where I've actually got a different query in this for user interface driven queries. Uh, this one here is where I've actually gone with the change. So, um, so Henry, your question about uh, performance here. Uh, this particular query that takes absolutely forever and is highly variable was loaded to both a worksheet and the data model. And that is the same query as what we have here for UI driven, which is actually one of the fastest queries if you load it just to a worksheet or if you load it to the data model, it takes slightly longer but less variation. So it really kind of uh, kind of depends. So uh, so Christian says it totally worked. Um, he uh, he got good uh, good use out of this and uh, and found out that his solution that he built was the slowest one. Awesome, um, dude. I, I I thought we'd had this conversation. You're supposed to be working on this faster stuff now. At any rate, but whatever. Um, it's all good. So Christian and I go way back. We uh, we've had many conversations around this. So so this is this is one of those things to sort of help you sort of understand a little bit about what's going on in uh, in your models. Um, I use this frequently when I've built two solutions and I want to compare which one is faster, or when I've actually put out a recipe for something and somebody comes back and says, "Hey, I did it this way. Is yours better than mine?" And you know the answer to that is always. It depends, um, but in this case here, we can go back and we can actually do some timings on these uh, different pieces here. Uh, just for reference, what I'm actually timing in this particular case here, um, the and, and I, I just sort of want to call this out really quickly um, on this, is that uh, the UI-driven query that we see here that has the fastest results when it is um, when it is actually running with privacy off is a user interface driven method of something that I originally wrote up in M is for data monkey. Uh, and it was a version of a power query V lookup. The version that's in M is for data monkey is horrendously inefficient and slow. And when the second version of the book comes out, we will be replacing it with something that can be driven entirely through the user interface without writing any code and actually performs way better. And this is one of the things that we actually sort of looked at was timing it when we when we figured it out, went, holy cow, this makes no sense. Why are we doing things this way? So that's kind of one of the practical places where I get to use this thing to try and figure out how to make my own code better along the way. All right, so that uh, that is our, uh, our time sleuth. Uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to hop into a demo of uh, some other stuff. I want to show you um, another piece here uh, called Pivot Sleuth. Um, and Pivot Sleuth is a tool that I built um, specifically because I got into the situation um, playing around with uh, with pivot tables, and uh, particularly in Power Pivot, where we ran into this issue. So I've got two fact tables, two dimension tables, three measures, and I've got some errors in my pivot table configurations. Now, what I want to show you is I'm going to look at uh, at my data. So again, we're back to the same kind of old, you know, sort of set up here for the data that, uh, that we saw before for a different model. And I'm just going to go and hop in and I'm going to show you the data model behind this because what I want you to recognize about this is that this data model, with an exception that I'm going to show you, is actually fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's set up beautifully well. Okay, so all good. But what we end up with 
is when we go over and we take a look at our pivot table, we get the dreaded relationships between tables maybe needed error message. And I have found that this has just made people tear their hair out with Power Pivot and not have any idea as to how to solve this. So what Pivot Sleuth is all about is it's a tool to help you understand what's gone wrong. This drives me crazy and I wish I could figure out how to do this is to actually get my windows to stay up front. This happens to me all the time with it. So sometimes, unfortunately, this opens and then goes behind Excel, uh, and we're, we're still trying to work through. We've spent, God, days of development trying to figure out how to get this to always stay up front. But uh, regardless, what you can see here is it appears that we have a problem. It's in red. We've got this thing for sales category, and if you mouse over it, it'll give you a really big, long message here. Unfortunately, it goes away before you had the chance to read the whole thing. So if you click on it, it'll bring you up the, the message here. And it basically says, look, this field sales category has no relationship to and can't filter budgets. Therefore, it's showing grand totals for the field. Um, additionally, it's a foreign key. It might work. But basically, what we're actually um, recommending here is that you hide sales category to prevent its use, and you don't use these particular tables in your dimensional model. A shorter message, if you come over and take budget, it says this can't be filtered by sales category, and you can see sales category here. A big difference between what I show in the values area here, we've tried to actually make this look like the default look for your pivot table interface. A big difference, though, is that I'm actually showing you the exact fully qualified field names that are being used here, not what's been named to show in the values area down the bottom here. So these can be different, right? So I show you the fully qualified name, and then if you mouse over it, I'll show you the caption, plus I'll tell you exactly what's going wrong. Now there's a lot to parse in here, okay? So you gotta read that really carefully, but basically what it's telling you is giving you context-sensitive help to say, your issue is actually right here. You shouldn't be using category from this table, you should be using category from this one. So if I take this off, and I come back and put category on, you'll notice that it now works and there's no error message over here anymore. And what we actually recommend you do, and this is in that same text, is that you come back and say, hey, you know what? You use this field in this relationship. In order to prevent that from happening, come here and hide this. And you should actually be doing this for every foreign key. That's the uh, relation, or that's the field on the many side. We're gonna hide click date here as well. We're going to go and we're going to hide date here as well. And when we go back to Excel and we now look at the list of tables, category is not here. It's impossible to put it onto this pivot table. And it's impossible to get yourself into that specific scenario. So that's the first part of the uh, of this um, of this uh, particular um, pivot sleuth feature here. So let me just close that one out, and I'm going to show you another one. Uh, no, I do not want to save that. Uh, let me show you another one here. So this guy here, uh, we have a similar setup, but this one actually works with a measures table. So if I go and take a look at the data model, what we can see over here, we now have a specific measures table on the side. But again, we've got a very simple pivot table. And honestly, this pivot table is 100% functional and 100% accurate, but it's still showing this crazy message here. And the reason why? Well, let's take a look. What does Pivot Sleuth say? Pivot Sleuth says, I'm going to be shy and hide behind Excel again. But it says, I don't know what these guys are all about. We can't actually filter it. Now, this message is a little bit different. But basically, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, it says what you need to do is you need to come in here and hide this. And if you hide the unaggregated column on this table, at that point, the error message is going to go away and everything's going to work. You're going to get a clean bill of health from Pivot Sleuth. So that looks much nicer. Now, there's another issue in this file, though, because if I come over here, even though the measures table is hidden, I've now got a pivot table and everything, there's no message showing up in the right hand side over here to say that it's got a relationship problem. But we can see that there's some stuff that's a little bit weird going on. My sales here, Total 3.99 million. My sales for 2018 and 2019, whoa, where did that go? Uh, hang on, come back. My sales for 2018 and 2019 are exactly the same number, and my total sales are exactly the same number. That seems to be awfully coincidental and not right. So even though there's no error message showing, Pivot Sleuth comes back and it gives me some more information about this. It says, look, this is a foreign key. It might work, but 
one of the things that it may do is it may actually get you to show grand totals because it can't cross filter other tables. So again, we recommend that you actually avoid using these things here and we use the primary key instead. You see a slightly different message over here, budgets is a fact table, you shouldn't use these because these can cause grand totals to show as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make some changes here. Here's budget year, I should actually be using calendar year, so we'll take this one off. We'll put this one on. Things look a little bit better. Pivot Sleuth comes back and says, yeah, but you still got the sales category that's a problem. Now we already know from previous that we should have been hiding these keys anyway. So I'm gonna take this one off, put my sales category here on. You'll notice that pivot table is much shorter and everything works at this point. And now Pivot Sleuth actually gives you a clean bill of health on it. So again, it's just a, another sort of feature set to go through here and help you out a little bit to uh, to sort of you know understand some of the things that are actually going on and uh, and make it a little bit easier, particularly if if you're not feeling super strong on the dimensional modeling components here. Now there is you know you do need to know a little bit about dimensional modeling to understand the, the terminology we're throwing at you. I can't give you that knowledge, but I can try and guide you along the way, and that's what this thing is uh, is sort of trying to work through and do here. Um, so. That's uh, that's our pivot sleuth feature, and it can work into some really complex components and, and whatnot. But um, I'll uh, I'll skip those ones uh, on that guy. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to uh, toss this guy away here, and I'm going to go into a uh, another uh, little model here, and I'm going to show you another feature. This one here being called uh, Dax sleuth. So what we have in this case here is we have a much larger file. There's all kinds of, uh, of good stuff that's in here. And uh, you can see that I have a ton of DAX measures that I've written for this thing here. And one of the things that doesn't really exist in Excel is a good tool in order to be able to go through and manage your DAX measures. Because we've got this measures dialogue with manage measures, but if you're trying to figure out what's nested where, what these things are actually doing, it's really kind of hard to see. So for this reason, we built this guy here called Dax Sleuth, which looks similar to our Query Sleuth in a lot of ways. It's got a very similar framework on it. Um, and I'm just going to go and show you the legend in this case here, because I think this is important to know. Uh, I have an implicit measure here. This is where somebody just dragged a column into the pivot table and let it go. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's still being used, just means that it was there. I have some measures like sales here that has, uh, it is an explicit measure because it's yellow. It does not have any children measures though. And then I've got a whole bunch of measures here that are green with little symbols. These guys are measures that have children. And if I double click on it, you can actually see the measure hierarchy here. We automatically indent your DAX. May not be exactly the same as what SQL BI does here, but we're also giving you a chain, right? So you've got sales units here. We can see sales units here, so we can step right into it to try and figure out what's going on inside your DAX measure. And I'm trying to remember which of these guys has uh, has more levels of this one. Uh, I'm trying to remember because I thought one of them actually went a little bit deeper. Ah, there we go. Burger sold all time. It's got a calculated statement with all calendar, but it's picking up burger sold, which looks like this, which is picking up sales units, which looks like this. One of the other things that I think is really, really useful to, to sort of understand about this is where is burgers sold all time used? Well, it's used on pivot table two on sheet three. We can see that by looking over here. And if I go and click on pivot table two, it'll take me right to that pivot table, which is kind of cool. So we can actually navigate through the workbook with this. So let's go look at burgers sold. Looks like it's being used in the same place. But if I look at sales units, it's being used on this pivot table and this one and this one. So I can actually start, you know, playing around and taking a look at what's going on in there. Again, you can indent, you can unindent your DAX. We also have a really cool little feature with this one here where if you want to actually flatten this down a little bit, you can do that. You can say, look, I don't want to see burger sold. Can you bring burger sold right into this guy? Uh, we nest it in the calculate that's actually being required here and, uh, and we'll actually show you what goes on and then we can flatten this guy down even a little bit more to, uh, to take a look at it. So I don't do this often, um, but sometimes it's, uh, it's helpful to actually go back and take a look at these things. Uh, so that's a tool that's useful there. Uh, we can duplicate measures. So let's say that we had a draft sold measure here. And I say, geez, you know, I really like this measure, but I actually want to have one here for um, bottled beer instead. 
So what I can do is I can go and duplicate this, and I'm going to call this one bottled beer. This will create a new measure using exactly the same signature and format. So here it comes. Do, do, do. I hadn't loaded the data model yet. It's usually a little bit faster than this, but there we are. There's bottled beer. So now I can go in and say, look, the only change that I needed to make with this guy here was I needed to call this one bottled beer. I'll just update that. And I now have a new bottled beer measure in my model right away. Nice and easy to use there as well. So um, then I can go and start adding that to pivot table. So, so that's our, uh, our DAX sleuth uh, feature that tells us a little bit about our DAX as well um, when we're looking at different things there. All right, now we've moved across for, uh, for most of the different um, things and now I'm sort of working into model sleuth. And this is where we start getting into uh, the ability to start uh, interrogating and figuring out what's actually in our model. So on Model Sleuth, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and run a little model summary report on this. And what the model summary does is it actually goes through all of the power queries and all of the power pivot uh, stuff in the workbook, and it actually generates us a nice little report to tell us what's going on. So the first thing you'll see here is that I've got nine model tables, I've got nine relationships, there's 20 measures, and this model takes 10.8 uh, megs of data inside it in order to run. Uh, nine of my queries are loaded as a data model, seven to connection only. That gives me 16. Although one thing that you need to know is that this is not the sum of the items above um, because you could have something that's loaded to both the data model and the worksheet as well. I tell you how many are coming from Power Query. Uh, this guy right here, direct to external sources, is a massive red flag for me when I'm auditing a model because it tells me somebody's not loading through Power Query to the data model which means that there's a danger that the model may need to be rebitten or rebuilt if something changes. So I actually watch for that really carefully. I can tell you all about all of the different relationships that are in here, what their primary keys are and foreign keys. So this is basically a list of the relationships that are actually inside the data model, including whether or not they're active or inactive and their cardinality. In Excel, everything you see for cardinality will be many to one. Of course, that would lead you to believe that maybe you can actually run this against something else that's not Excel-based. So we'll come back to that. Table summary stats uh, tells me about the tables. It tells me what kinds of tables they are based on what my algorithm says. So are they facts or are they dimensions? It tells me if they're disconnected. It even tells me if a table is snowflaked. In this particular case, what a snowflake table is in this one is if I go and look at the model, uh, I have got, this is kind of a gross and ugly model here, but this chit headers is a dimension in this particular case, and it has a dimension hanging off of it. There's actually no reason to do this. This is a snowflake table. I could merge everything back to this table and keep it nice and clean, and I wouldn't need to have this guy out on the other side. So that's what your snowflake dimension is table is. We tell you if it's disconnected, like our business lines table over here. Those are both picked up immediately inside this thing, so that's something that I would also go and look for. I'll tell you how many rows are in the tables, how many columns are in them, what the data source is. So if it's coming from somewhere other than Power Query, we can see it here. You can learn about your table columns. Here's your table. What's the column names? What are the data types that are in them? How many unique values these have? For those who are really big on Power Pivot compression, unique values is the driver of compression. This is really important information to know. We also tell you if they're visible or hidden. Uh, good luck in trying to get that through VBA, folks. You will not be able to find that out. You've got to do some really big trickery, which I've done. Um, I actually have my own custom object model running behind the scenes here in order to actually give us this. Uh, we see data columns. We've also got calculated columns as well. We pick up as well as what their formulas are here as well. So we can see all kinds of good stuff here um, around this. Uh, I ran this on one client's model and discovered a whole bunch of extra date tables that he didn't know he was carrying. Um, once we cut those things out, we actually cut the size of the model down by 70%. It was massive, big savings in different data. Uh, all of your measures get listed. Um, what's the table type or what's the table they're stored on? Is it a fact or dimension table? You don't really want to store measures on dimensions. Are they explicit or implicit measures? We always love explicit measures better. Uh, are they used? Are they not used? I don't know if you've ever written a measure and wonder if you used it or not, but this is a way that you can find out. We also can tell you what the, uh, what the formulas are here along the way. Um, I should also point out that if you prefer to indent this using um, SQL BI stuff uh, from DAX Studio, uh, you can do that um, because this is actually an Excel table and uh, so you can basically highlight that stuff. Um, thanks to Christian who's on the call, that was his suggestion, so uh, that's been, been done. 
Uh, and now we also down the bottom here also have a list of all of the individual power queries as well as what their precedents are and where their dependents are as well. So what's kind of neat about this is that because it's a table, you can actually grab this. You can go to table design and you can go and say, show me the filter buttons. And I can go and filter for everything here that's not a query and is not blanks. And this will actually tell me about the data sources that are being fed inside my workbook. So that's kind of a neat little thing here. Uh, let me show you uh, some more things around uh, this because we've got some other things we can do with Model Sleuth, like run a model memory usage report. And inside the model memory usage report, I can tell you exactly how much model memory is being consumed, as well as stuff for Excel that is recoverable because it's not being used. So if I go in and take a look at this, we can see that I never used this full format. These guys here, full month name, day name, were not used anywhere, nor was day. So I can trim these from my power query, get them out of the data model, and at that point I could save myself a little bit of space. And if I'm working on a client solution, when I'm done, there is nothing that is recoverable because I trim all this stuff up and make it as lean and mean as efficient as possible. Uh, speaking of that, we have an unused columns report, but I think this one here is much more interesting. This is an unused items report. We actually go through, we scan your queries, your columns, your measures, and we tell you natural columns that are not being used that you can remove from your tables. We tell you about any explicit measures that are not being used and any implicit measures. Please, if you do run this and you see an implicit measure and you go, I don't have that implicit measure, go and show the ones that are hidden because yes, you do. If I've reported it, it's there. It's, it's you know, we're 100% we're confident on, the, on that particular piece. So that's just some of the, the stuff that we do as far as sort of an audit component around uh, what's going on with, uh, with some of these guys. Now, I wanna show you this in the context of, this model that you're looking at here is pretty simple. I wanna show you this in the context of where this stuff really starts to matter. So I'm just gonna open up another file here. This is gonna take a little bit to open. All right. Uh, this is based on a real world project. Um, it's been changed to protect the guilty and the innocent. Uh, but basically um, what I want to do is I want to just sort of hop over to, uh, to this uh, map. Um, this is actually, this, uh, this file was, uh, was really um, a big piece of the reason that I actually built the query sleuth and the tracing piece, because what you're looking at here is a hand-drawn map of the power query flow in order to drive into the tables in the middle of my data model. And I kid you not, this is really what the power query flow actually looks like. Uh, if you go and take a look at this thing in monkey tools using query sleuth, um, you can actually see just how complicated this guy is. So I'm going to make this an awful lot bigger and I'm going to hide my legend on this one here, get rid of it, uh, because you can see how many queries are here. And if I go in and take a look at, say, the forecast query and open this up, you can see how many dependencies are actually in place for just forecast. There's a ton, all nested, all going through multiple levels along the way. Uh, I built this because I worked with a client who was a scope changer, and he liked to change pieces that became cornerstones. They didn't need to change something, and it was down here. And went, oh, man, what is this going to affect? So we needed the ability to trace this backwards and forwards. I didn't mention this, but you can switch between precedence and dependence to sort of get those views backwards and forwards as to what's going on. Um, I'm going to go and run on this one here, my model summary report. Uh, I'm not going to say that this is going to be the best example of how I would necessarily say that I built a model here, um, but I will say that it's probably one of the ones that was uh, most effective for my client. Um, this I ended up saving them a ton of money. Uh, but you can see here that uh, we actually have data sources that are coming from workbook tables rather than from Power Query, so that's linked directly into the data model. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of calculated columns. Shame on Ken. Um, that shouldn't have happened, but it did. Uh, so there's a bunch of those, so I can trace them down and fix them. Uh, a bunch of different measures in here, a whole pile of individual queries along the way. And using this tool, I could go back and say, look, if I wanted to clean this up, show me the unused items along the way. And at this point in time, it'll come back and it will show me everything that I can actually trim out of the model, both um, from a uh, DAX point of view and from a query point of view to really uh, end up helping clean these kind of things up. So. Uh, this is where some of this stuff, uh, you know, became uh, super, super useful um, along the way for uh, for what we're dealing with with uh, <clears throat> with trying to actually sort of understand and audit our models. Now, I've only got about like think about ten minutes left um, here to go, so I'm just going to demo uh, one more feature here, and then uh, 
I'd, I'd really love to open it up to other questions along the way. But uh, basically what I want to show you is this. Um, I'm going to go and pick up a uh, Power BI desktop file. So I'm going to do a, a quick little browse here, go to uh, Monkey Tools and go to Demos. And I'm going to open this LP Azure for SQL. Uh, this is a Power BI desktop file that I built um, that uh, is built against the SQL Azure database. Uh, what's happening right now is Monkey Tools has kicked off the process of opening Power BI. Um, this is something that I, uh, I do need to do in order to be able to extract the components from the model. I kind of wish I could open this behind the scenes, but that's kind of a dangerous thing to do, and it kind of leaves uh, leaves Excel sort of hanging while this goes on. Um, I also wish I could open Power BI behind Excel because it kind of gets in my way. But now that Power BI is opening and refreshing its visuals, I'm going to hop back over to Excel. You'll notice it tells me the data model has been loaded. And what I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm just going to go file blank workbook and uh, load up over here. And let's go and see if we can see some stuff around, I don't know, let's look at the DAX sleuth and see what we got. Hey, look at that. There we go. So this is the DAX sleuth running against the LP Azure SQL model. So you can see that uh, it's got its measures in this. Uh, I have the ability to flatten, duplicate, and even update the model so I can write measures back, new DAX measures back to Power BI from here. Uh, I don't anticipate that people are going to be, you know, going to pick up this tool specifically to write DAX in Power BI. I mean, there's other tools to do that, obviously. Tabular Editor and, uh, you know, um, DAX Studio are, are great for that kind of thing. But some of the other cool things that we can do with this is that I can also go and take a look at the query sleuth on the model that's actually happening right there against Azure DB. So this is now using my tools to go back and take a look at what's happening inside the Power BI file. Now, one thing that I really wish I could do against Power BI is click an update button to write a query to the Power BI model. Unfortunately, there is no API to do that today. And I have tried a bunch of different hacks and workarounds but unfortunately, it is not possible to write, uh, at least not that I've found, to write um, M code back to a Power BI file, which is a real shame. I, I'm dying for the ability to do this. The other cool thing that we can do here, though, I can run your model summary against your Power BI model. Now, I can't tell you for 100% certain whether or not everything is being used or not. We don't actually interrogate the Power BI visuals at this point in time. It's something that we want to add. But this sort of explains why we might need to actually add things like more cardinalities for relationship types to Power BI, because you can have a real one-to-one -one or ooh, a many-to-many, -many. yuck, don't do that. Um, but you can actually pick those things up right inside here. We can actually then report on it. So the idea behind this thing is that this basically ends up acting as a documentation tool against your Power BI models to extract this information and show you what's going on. When I mentioned that model that I actually interrogated from uh, from my client, it was actually a Power BI model that I ran this against to see what was going on and realized that we had a massive amount of memory that was being consumed because he did not turn off the built-in date table templates. And that was kind of a big issue, right? Because you know it, it ends up consuming a bunch of space. We turned those off, reloaded it, boom, everything went so much faster. Uh, things were a lot more stable. So it was kind of a, a useful thing to be able to actually go and do. Um, today, when I go and actually sit in a, and ask the expert session, or at least, you know, back when we're, you know, in person at a, at a conference and we have that ability, uh, one of the first things that I'll do, whether it's an Excel or a Power BI model, is, is I'll ask someone if, if they can load it on a USB stick and let me run my stuff against um, this, because I can actually get a really good idea as to what's going on in a model just by looking at this stuff here. You know, taking a quick look at, you know, where's your measures? Are they stored on facts or dimensions? How many of these things do you actually have and, and different stuff like that? Or even where your data sources are coming from. It's, it's a very, very useful thing to be able to actually extract and, and take a look at. Um, one final thing that I'll sort of point out, this works for both Excel and Power BI. Uh, if you're a DMV person and you like to go and actually start uh, taking a look at different things along the way here, um, let me see, what uh, what DMVs could I actually go, I don't know, let's go and take a look at, say, measures. Uh, so if I go and, and run a measures DMV, I can actually extract all of the measures. I can run them from the Excel model or from the Power BI model. Um, and I can even go and say, look, you know, I'd like to uh, customize this a little bit here. Uh, if you're not a DMV person, don't worry about it. This is uh, this is hardcore stuff. 
when I originally wrote Monkey Tools, I wrote this for my own ability. Uh, I put it out and then I took it away and I got a bunch of questions back from people saying, what happened to that? It was really useful. So we added it back in. So uh, at this point, I can actually run my own DMVs. Uh, you need to know the SQL expressions for this. This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's certain DMV um, calls that are supported and certain ones that aren't, but we do at least give you the list of all of the DMV tables um, and we can run these things and uh, you know, you can start interrogating the models your own way if you uh, if you want to do that. So, all right. And on that note, um, that has been a whirlwind tour through a whole bunch of stuff that Monkey Tools does. I would love to take questions and feedback um, on this thing for uh, for anything that, uh, that that people have questions on. You know, yep. Let me know. Open Thank time. Thank you, Ken. It's been uh, uh, quite a journey. <laughs> I wish we here. have time to explore uh, every little corner of the tool. And I know there's different uh, skill levels. Um, the, our members attending the session may have different skill levels, and some of them I, I, I can imagine, like myself, could, could use some more time to really think more through each one of the features but it was um, really good to see all the things that we can have with that and some of them even teach us some stuff like you showed with the pivot tables uh, the relationships and all that so it's uh, i'm really excited to try this tool thank you so yeah, much it's, ken it's fun stuff and i mean let me know if you find any bugs along the way um i see that there's a question from brent about is there anything in the tool to confirm if your power query is folding or where the folding breaks occur uh no there is not uh i don't do that um and you know what i think that honestly uh query folding is such an incredibly complicated topic um that Honestly, I think that's going to be Microsoft's job to solve and come up with uh, with steps in order to deal with that. So um, I, I don't anticipate that I'm going to get into that area. I, it just it, it's such a nebulous thing to try and deal with. So, um, so <laughs> I also see a question: Do I think the new diagram view previewed and data flows will ever come to Excel? Yes. When? Don't know. Um, you know, typically the way that uh, that these guys go and they build these features out, uh, they uh, they try these things. Um, uh, you know, in uh, in data flows first to try and sort of build it in online format, then they'll end up putting it into Power BI Desktop and then it comes to Excel afterwards. So that's the sort of general flow for these things. Uh, you know, whether or not uh, whether or not that's in the near future or not, I have no idea. So, um, and yes, Brent, definitely nothing wrong with making Microsoft do a little bit of extra work along the way. I mean, I, I'm. You say, I'm trying to do the pieces that I can, but I think that there's certain parts that I just have to look back at and go, yeah, you know what? The development effort on my side will be so high, and uh, you know, if I can't sell it, that's a, that's a big issue here. So, mm -hmm. um, actually, speaking of which, I should probably just uh, sort of round this out with uh, with something here. I should probably throw up a slide here about the resources and and whatnot here. So, yes, um, and how to sorry to interrupt. I was thinking also some people may want to know where to get the tool and how. What's the installation process, if any at all? Yeah. So, so basically, if you go to uh, excelguru.ca slash monkey tools, um, that is the uh, the page. Um, Eric, thank you for the comment that it's the easiest 99 bucks ever. Uh, is licensed by user, by computer, or what? Um, the license is actually set up. Uh, one license can be installed on up to three computers. So that is the uh, the sort of the model that we went with on that one there. Um, I should mention on this stuff that I mean you guys did see a mixture of pro or of free and pro features in this. I did mention that there's only one feature that doesn't uh, fully work in the um, in the trial version. One pro feature doesn't, and that is the model documentation report. We only give you every other line in the trial. Uh, we feel that that one has has enough value that um, if you're doing documentation on models that. You know, we feel that you can pay us 99 bucks to, to make your life that easy. Um, outside of that, the stuff that you'll see is that the query sleuth, the DAX sleuth, uh, these things work in the free versions. They may not um, highlight and they may not indent the same way, uh, and you may not be able to create new things from them. But uh, actually, I think the indenter does work in the free versions, to be honest with you, but the color colorification doesn't. So we're trying to make sure that we put enough stuff in this that you can justify having it on your machine, even if it is the free version. Uh, the um, calendar generator is a pro tool. 
However, the uh, ability to create the, um, the measures using uh, either the individual measure builder or the bulk measure builder, those will always be forever free versions. When we start moving into more complicated measure generators, those ones will end up being part of the pro feature set. So to say we're trying to give you a lot of value for what, uh, for what it is, even if you are on a free license. We'd like to see this on people's machines, whether you're paying us or not. Um, but obviously, I mean, at the end of the day, I, you know, I got a full-time developer. I'm paying to work on this stuff. So, uh, you know, we're also trying to, uh, to, um, to justify that. Uh, as far as volume licenses, um, thank you, Vivek. Uh, my question would be, if you're, uh, if you're interested in volume licenses, um, please send me a note. Let's talk. Uh, because uh, I don't have an official uh, sort of scheme up for that one, but I am happy to explore that, um, more than happy to explore that. So shoot me a note. You can, you know, send me a direct message on Twitter. Uh, you can email me. You can hit my uh, my website through my contact form, or you can email me at uh, ken at excelguru.ca, um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're more than happy to chat on that as well. So um, thanks for that question, Vivek. I appreciate that. How, how is it uh, for installation if uh, does it require admin uh, credentials or anyone no. can, can have this? You know, so so we actually work pretty hard on that one. Um, so it is a com add-in. Com add-ins generally do require admin rights, depending on how it's been set up. Uh, but we actually managed to uh, to get this uh, working. We, uh, um, we we spent a lot of time uh, working with our, our deployment mechanisms to make sure that you do not need to have admin rights in order to install this. Um, there is a digital certificate that is uh, is behind it um, to uh, um, to sort of allow that process to happen. So. Uh, what that means is that it doesn't necessarily work for everyone because some companies do block um, the digital certificate that we've used. Uh, however, I think that of all the installs we've had, I think we've had one user or maybe two that have been in that scenario. Um, so for the most part, it should work. I mean, my advice, though, is that if you're in that scenario where you're concerned about it and you don't really want to put money out on, on something, guess what? That's why we have a free trial, right? So download the free trial, try to install it. If it works, well, guess what? Now you know it's going to work. And if you uh, if you want to uh, to give it a shot for a couple of weeks, and honestly, I didn't tell you right now, try it for a couple of weeks before you put the money into the machine. If it looks like it's going to be worth it, then try it, or then buy it. And if it doesn't, you know what? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm happy to take your money, but I'd really rather you were getting value out of it. That's the whole big thing here. I, I'm not trying to, you know, to to get everybody to pay us on this. I, I want people to get use out of this thing. That's what it's all about. So. Um, so yeah, should work without admin rights. Absolutely, that's that's the game. So um, you do need to be online to do the activation and to get the updates. Um, we do push updates, uh, you know, whenever we fix a bug um, and and we've got a, a solid fix for it, uh, we'll push that out. Um, the software automatically checks every couple of weeks, um, and uh, you know we'll continue to do that. We don't have a, an official release schedule for it, but. Uh, when we have new features ready, we release them. And when we have new bug fixes ready, ready, we release them. If they're big, I'll blog about it. That's probably the best place to get information about what's going on with Monkey Tools is to uh, is to hit my blog because that's where we tell people about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Please, please feel free to turn on your microphones, your cameras, if you'd like to say hello. Uh, There's a question from Christian there. On the chat. Hey, yeah, I see one question, uh, question from Christian, and then uh, Richard will take yours. Um, is it working with normal pivots? Um, it, everything around this whole thing is really about data model pivots. Um, that's what we're actually going after. So um, your normal pivots are, I mean, does anybody build normal pivots anymore? So um, any teasers on my roadmap for future enhancements? Uh, sure. Um, we're, we're working uh, next on building... Um, I, I want to build some more more powerful quick measure kind of components, uh, similar to uh, to some of the stuff around. Uh, um, well, let, let's talk about it. Let's do date and time, um, and also doing some complicated, more complicated patterns for uh, for accountants, things like you know flipping signs halfway down the pivot table and stuff like that. So, um, Richard, you had a question as well. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your great presentation. This is Dick Moffat. I don't know. If, oh, hey, if Dick. You're... Dick is a Richard. short form of Richard. Yes. <laughs> so, I'd just like to thank you. It was, was very, very interesting. Very good stuff. Cool. Glad. And, uh, uh, maybe we'll talk it. soon. Maybe we'll talk soon. Okay. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, man. You bet. Um, 
I can see it looks like uh, DV. DV. Who, uh, hey, it's uh, Damu here. How are yes. you? Hey. It's a great presentation, Ken. It was a great Thank you. Person. I would like uh, you to. I organize the Atlanta uh, Excel user group. So if yep. you would like to, you know, come and speak, uh, be good, def definitely be good. Absolutely. Us. Absolutely. I'll reach uh, out to you later. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, that sounds Damu nice. Dharan. Great yeah. to great to see you here. I, I actually attended one of your user group when I was in Atlanta. Yeah, that's right. Power BI Palooza. Yeah, Over when I was returning from Orlando. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Good to see you. Ken, um, I also forgot to mention about your your um, meetup group in Vancouver. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Because I know that now you are running. Uh, it was a little bit more focused maybe on Power BI, but now you are uh, doubling. Uh, I, I always <laughs> There's so much Excel stuff going on with there. Excel. Yeah, I, I always stuffed Excel stuff in there. We, we were Excel and Power BI, but um, but yeah, so so the, um, the Vancouver Power BI user group, uh, we are now running um, dual tracks. So we have uh, two meetups a month. Um, and we are doing a an Excel focused meetup, and we are doing a uh, Power BI focused meetup. Um, I will say that the Power BI focused meetup this month is me, and I am going to be doing um, some stuff on uh, merging magic in Power Query. So we're going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff that involves or or replicates the process of doing data merges inside uh, Power Query. Um, that is this Thursday. Uh, the only thing for, well, actually, you know what? Never mind, because there's people from all over here. So um, we're going to be starting at about uh, six o'clock Pacific time is uh, is where we start. So um, if you're interested in uh, in picking that up, uh, you can actually head over to uh, Meetup. Let me just go and pick up the URL for that because I never have that off the top of my head. Um, but I'll uh, I'll give you a, a link to that guy as well. So uh, it's meetup.com. And if you just look up the Vancouver Power BI user group, that's where it is. Oh, geez, I signed out of everything too. So I've been, uh, been trying to solve problems with, uh, with different things and I had to clear all my cookies and signed in components on this stuff. So uh, now I am not a robot. Oh, geez. Select all the pictures with taxis. Don't you love this kind of stuff? <sighs> Log in. Here we go. We're getting there. We're getting there. So I. Uh, Demo, uh, there we are. The mother run. Uh, do you have any other questions? I still see your hand up. Uh, no. Uh, OK. Yeah. There Thank we you. go. So here, here comes the uh, here comes the, the um, session for uh, for what's going on on Thursday and um, and uh, that one. I mean, we do also record our stuff on YouTube and post it up uh, within a day or two. So um, at that point in time, uh, yeah, what would that be like? 2 a.m. UTC? Uh, yeah, something like that, somewhere around that. I would say catch catch me on the YouTube. It's probably going to be easier there. Um, but you know, the nice thing is at least we can do that these days, right? So that's uh, that's a good thing. So. Um, <clears throat> where's the next stop before Thursday is, uh, Calgary and, um, I'm, I'm unprepared with my links on that one. Actually, I got to, uh, got to figure out where that is. I'm just scared to open my email to actually pick that one up. So, uh, but if, if you're you following want me to, on Twitter, <laughs> I was going to say, if you want to want to send me those links, then when I send the email out, uh, w uh well, uh, I hope it's, when, when is that happen happening? Uh, that one's happening tomorrow. So... Okay, so we better post it on the chat now. <laughs> because yeah, I, I know. I may not uh, I send the email before that. Yeah, I know it's on the uh, I know it's on the Twitter because um, we definitely uh, we sent something out on that. But uh, hang on a second here. So do 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 do. Uh, this is hey, the some, someone already posted the link on the chat. Oh, well, there you go. That makes life a lot easier for me. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Yeah. So, yeah. so there is a there is a one more event uh, I would like to talk about. It's about a global power platform. I know it is Excel forum, but we have an Excel part of it in uh, as well. So it is a global power platform bootcamp. Uh, last year we organized around 3,300 people join, and it is happening on February 19th. So, 
If you have information you want to put on the chat, Vivek, please go ahead. Yeah, and I wanted to at the same time ask uh, Ken to present at uh, Toronto user group. <laughs> All right, send me an email. Vivek. Let's I'm, I'm booking. I'm booking you in advance. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Just send me an email and let's work out our calendars. Okay. I'm sure, we can make that happen. I'm sure, we can do that. So, I just posted on uh, chat. Right. Um, yeah, we okay. should. Uh, we should trade, Vivek. I, uh, I'll get you to come out and uh, and do our uh, do our group as well. Actually, uh, I did uh, in Calgary recently. Uh, I will. That's okay. You, you got to make have, Vancouver. You haven't done yeah, Vancouver I, yet. So. Yeah, I just came to Vancouver last time when, <laughs> when I saw you over there for Power Plate from Boot. Uh, no, Power Plate from World Two. There you go. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, yeah. Let's um. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's exchange emails and we'll sort something out. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Cheers. Any. All right, well, any other questions or comments or are we good? Let us know just the final moments before we close our session today. A great one. Thank you again, Ken. Hey, happy, and, happy, happy. Thanks uh, for having me. I appreciate it. Is there is there a supporting just one last question? If people have trouble with the tool, is there some kind of I know I, I noticed that you showed some kind of help or documentation for the tool. What's the best way to find help with with uh, any questions people may have? So there is uh, there is an almost up to date documentation right inside it from the link. Um, I will call it almost up to date because I do need to to uh, to do some updates to that um, with the new features there. Uh, outside of that, um, you know what? I, that's an area that I need to do a little bit better with is making sure that there's an easier way to contact us. But uh, honestly, the best way is actually to hit us through um, through the Excel Guru uh, website and go to the Contact Us form. Um, and at that point, uh, anything that gets logged goes directly to my team and I, and uh, and we follow up on uh, on bugs to try and actually run them to ground and get things sorted. So, um, but I know for sure that is an area that I want to do a little bit better job. I'd kind of like to have a link right inside the tool to, you know, fill out a form and you know, take your, uh, take the feedback right there. So we're, we're looking at improving that process. You'll get there. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, you know, copious amounts of free time and all that. Right. So yeah. there you go. So first you need to anyway. put the tool to work as better as, as well as possible. And then you'll worry about that. Yes, indeed. So, indeed. so, so I mean, overall, the, go ahead. The, the good news is, is that honestly, and I mean, not that I want to jinx anything or, or sort of encourage it, but we haven't had a ton of bug reports come in. We work hard to try and make sure they're not there. Um, however, there are some. I mean, you know, and it's it's software. It is what it is, right? So, but uh, yeah. So overall, Ken, thank you so much. Uh, you know, nobody tried this. You started, so I'm going to try your tool definitely, and uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, volume licensing also. Awesome. No, I appreciate that. Let's uh, yeah, let's send me an email, man. We'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll talk about presentations and volume licensing and all that kind of jazz. Okay. So, cool deal. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, it's been fun. Thank you Adam, for coming. Sure, we'll do this again. Yes, please. <laughs> all right. Cheers. Okay, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I hope you can join us again next time, uh, December the 2nd. Uh, we'll talk about cube functions and then we have already some good stuff prepared for the new year. Power Query indeed will we'll start off our new uh, 2000, uh, the year 2021. Thanks again. I'll stop the recording. I hope you, um, you, you to see you around and we'll talk soon. I'll send the email uh, with the information about the session as usual with the link for the video recording when it's posted on YouTube. OK, thank you. Have a good night, a good day, a good morning, wherever you are. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Stop the recording.